Okay, let's thank you. Let's get started with Hitchhiker's Guide to Highways and Byways. Take it away, Jim Deutsch. Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa. I'm delighted to be moderating this panel discussion on hitchhiking, uh, notes from past and present. And uh, I think we've got a wonderful panel, but we also will want to hear from you. So we're thinking that our panelists will talk for the first 45 to 50 minutes, and then we can open it up for questions, comments, sharing your own experiences, because we're all interested in learning more about this amazing topic of hitchhiking. Uh, I'm Jim Deutsch. I'm a curator with the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage here in Washington, DC. And um, I'm gonna ask uh, our, our, the, the five other panelists to, to briefly introduce themselves. And then I'll ask them to talk more about their hitchhiking experiences. So first, maybe just to introduce yourselves and we can go alphabetically by first name. So we'll start with Agnati. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Ignati and I'm originally from Chicago. I, um, I'm a theater artist. I do clowning and movement facilitating. I teach um, drama after school programs, a variety of things. And I'm also development director for an organization called Interplay. Uh, I went to Beloit College um, where I met Alex who is another hitchhiker on the call and um, where we dreamed up a lot about, um, you know, revolutionizing the world and continuing to try to do that. Great, thank you. Well, Alex is next alphabetically by first name. Alex? Hello. Um... I'm Alex and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And now I live in Kingston, New York, which is in the Hudson Valley. And I, like Gadi said, I went to Beloit College. I studied fine arts and I've done a lot of traveling, hitchhiking, um, a lot with Ignati and some of my other friends that are on this call right now. And I'm an artist primarily and an illustrator. And then for a living, I bake bread. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Ed, want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Ed Levy. I'm uh, of a different age group than, than the women who have spoken, but uh, I, I, I did a lot of hitchhiking in my youth. I, uh, I started hitchhiking when I was 14. My parents didn't have a car, so to get anywhere, it had to be hitchhiking. And um, in the, so between 14 and 20, I hitchhiked to, the 49 states, and um, and since since uh, that time, I've uh, not just been hitchhiking, but I've traveled around to 82 countries around the world. And um, as I say, the countries that I haven't been, there's two, there's two, there's the ones I've been to and the ones I want to go to. All right, thank you, Ed. Yeah, and I should say that the the difference in generations is deliberate. We wanted to hear. Uh, different stories from different generations. Uh, so next, uh, Herb, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, I'm Herb Levy. The last name is not a coincidence. Uh, Ed and I are brothers. In fact, we have been brothers for um, many years. Um, I am retired now, but my career was uh, in affordable housing. I ran uh, nonprofits nationally and locally uh, for better than 30 years. In my retirement, I remain committed to nonprofits. I am the board chair of Focus Music, the local uh, presenter of folk and acoustic music. Uh, and I'm also the treasurer of the Jewish Islamic Dialogue Society, an organization that um, brings Jews and Muslims together to break down barriers and hopefully be a, a ripple toward peace in the world. Uh, I grew up in the same house as Ed, so that neither, neither of us had a car to rely on. Um, and early in my life, I learned that the Baltimore Transit Company bus system didn't go everywhere that I wanted to go, but my thumb did. So uh, I found my way around Baltimore and um, much more to tell you about uh, 
some of the, the trips I took, but um, I am a child of the 60s. In 1967, I was in San Francisco. In 1968, I was at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. In 1969, I was in Woodstock. I did the trifecta. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, last alphabetically, Sarah, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, she, her pronouns. I'm originally also from Chicago and currently living in Granada, Spain. Um, I've hitchhiked, so to my bio, I had to do a whole count of over 25,000 miles of crossing the state several times and um, vast parts of South America and various trips throughout the world. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here. I'm a dancer and choreographer, cultural worker. Um, yeah, excited. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So let's kind of begin our conversation about hitchhiking. And this time I'll, I'll turn to um, Ed and uh, Herb. Maybe, you know, can you set the scene for, as you, you were saying, you're both children of the 1960s. So what was, the hitchhiking scene like at that time in the 1960s? Hitchhiking was both a way to um, get from place to place. Um, I mean, in the United States today, hitchhiking is a, is a rare phenomenon, but it was the way to get around, especially for people like myself who didn't have an automobile. Um, and, but it was also the way to explore uh, parts of the country that I had not been to. Uh, and I, that would lead me into a story, so I'll, I'll stop there for the moment and give it a chance to say something. Yeah, yeah that's good. Well, uh, and hitchhiking, uh, uh, Herb was a, either a good or a bad influence on me in many, in many ways, but getting me out of hitchhiking, it was definitely his, his influence. Uh, and uh, uh, and it, it, it helped, uh, well, it changed the person who I was. I was uh, a very introverted person until I got out hitchhiking and got out uh, meeting people who I otherwise would never have met and uh, traveled around the country and, and around the world that way. And we, you would um, be at the uh, exit ramp, the, the in ramp on, a, on an interstate highway, and, and there could be a dozen people there, and 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 um, and you'd all be friends, you know, ten minutes after uh, meeting each other. Yeah. So actually, I think that's a good uh, segue, Ed, because as you're saying, you know, there were maybe a dozen people by an exit ramp and anyone who's on the roads today knows that is not the case. So I'd like to ask um, Agnati, Alex and Sarah, um, how would you describe the, the hitchhiking scene of the 21st century? And uh, what got you started as hitchhikers? Um, anyone want to jump in to be first? I can start us off. Uh, I will also spotlight myself. Um, so I think, you know, Alex actually introduced me to the notion that I could actually hitchhike and, you know, my parents had hitchhiked. My dad, um, was a, a a uh, child of the 60s and had traveled all around Spain and hitchhiked all around the state. So I heard a lot of stories, but it wasn't until conversations with Alex who had been in Europe. And I feel like culturally places in Europe, um, it's a lot more common, um, especially in France, um, which later after hitchhiking in the US, I got to experience. But another sort, I was thinking about this. So another sort of like millennial hitchhiking thing is actually ride sharing on an app and Craigslist, which is like the, the 21st century version of hitchhiking. So you can kind of like, look on the side and see where people are going um so that oh yeah blah blah car exactly that there's like money exchange in some of these situations like blah blah car um but sometimes ride share is just like really oh we just want to share a ride okay well alex since you've been targeted as one of agnati's inspirations how did you get your start or what 
what motivated you to start hitchhiking? Yeah, I um, actually, my best friend, Julia, who I think is on the call right now, she was living in France um, when we were seniors in high school. And then she moved to France after we graduated. And so she introduced me to hitchhiking in France first, which it was very easy to do and it was pretty commonplace to see people hitchhiking in Europe. And then, um, I don't know, it was in my my really early 20s where I just kind of had this thought and it was like, well, if I can hitchhike in Europe, maybe I should just try hitchhiking in the US. I honestly don't remember when the first time I hitchhiked in the US was, um, but truly I know almost no one else who has hitchhiked in the US except for people who would be considered on the fringes of society like train hoppers or people who are you know um, needing or in a crisis or maybe someone who's just car broke down and they have to get somewhere but um you know it's very like ignati said i think ride sharing especially in like the 90s and the 2000s was really big i don't think it's even as a thing as much anymore i don't really see it so much but i i've used a lot of um, ride sharing off of craigslist which is um, and even truckers would do ride share stuff but um, that's mostly it for me. Yeah. Well, Sarah, let me ask. So you've you've logged some twenty five thousand miles. Uh, do you remember the first of those twenty five thousand, and what got you started with hitchhiking? Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, I remember. Um, I'll answer the first question first. Um, I, in my early 20s, I, I did a study abroad program in South India and left the program essentially at some point to travel by myself for about a year. And um, it, at that time, you know, I traveled with my, with my savings for my high school jobs and, and just fell in love with, you know, this sense of, of not knowing where and how things were going to evolve on a day-to-day -day basis and having to be in a in a place of listening um, to myself and to the world and, and to this unfolding of you know every adventure leads to the next um, and and then there was also in in India there was I, I hitchhiked some um, and but there there was a real sense for me of you know I'm coming from the states I'm a white person in this you know from the states there's so much. Uh, distance between my experience and the people and the places even as we you know come close together and even as we're sharing all these experiences you know that something inside of me really grew this for me I, I lived it almost as like an obligation of like I need to know my own country as a backpacker I need to know um, what it feels like to move through space um, to sleep outside um, to not know and to meet the people of, of my own land um, in this way. And so I came with an, a vendetta. Like when I came back, I was just like, all right, well now I have to cross the States. Um, and, and just the way that things worked out, the first actual ride that was like a true hitchhiking that wasn't a ride um, between people who I kind of knew um, began in Arkansas and it was a truck driver um, who had just, he, he was processing a divorce. And, and these are the kinds of moments of, you know, when people, when you're sharing rides with people, people open their souls and their lives to you because um, it's such a contained moment and you're trusting each other so deeply. And so that's what I remember about that ride is um, jumping into a, into a truck at a gas station in Arkansas and, and hearing about this person's life and, and loss in, in this divorce. Yeah, well, let me ask, let me follow up on that, uh, Sarah, with um, uh, Ed and, and Herb. You've also talked about this sense of trust and, you know, getting into someone's car. You want to talk more about that and, you know, bring us back some 40, 50 years. Uh, what was that experience like for you? Well, there just basically was trust. I mean, I was, I was accustomed to hitchhiking around Baltimore City. So I got in and out of all kinds of people's cars. I had the high school, went to a citywide school um, downtown 
and hitchhike to school, hitchhike from school, about five miles in each direction. So I, I traveled through some rough neighborhoods to, to get to and from school, but there was never any concern about whose car I was getting into. There was a um, just a, an, a blind trust, uh, but, but a trust that was real. I mean, much later, a lot has been said about the lack of safety of hitchhiking. Um, and I think it, it's unfortunately shut the practice down in the United States. But I, I, I can't count the number of miles that I've hitchhiked, but thousands and thousands of miles. I never had an incident where I felt uncomfortable or unsafe. Um, when I was 23, I spent six months hitchhiking around Europe and uh, 1977. And, in, um, and it was a different world then than now, but uh, uh, then if, if you were in a richer country, if you were in Germany or France or, or UK, uh, people our age had cars and the more likely it was the people in their 20s had cars, the more likely it was you get a, uh, picked up for a ride uh, quickly. Uh, there, there are other places where people were very friendly, but uh, they, they had six members of the family in a five uh, seat car. So there, there wasn't going to be room for you. And I, I wanted to share, I, I, I stretched this a little bit by calling it a poem, but this was one thing that uh, that I thought up in those days that stuck with me in it. And I, uh, I'm sitting by the side of the road and I go, people drive by, look at me and say, no fucking way. That's, that's my, uh, that was the, the memory of my, uh, of my uh, po poetry experience at the time. And it, it kind of, it, it didn't matter. Like if you had six months to hitchhike around Europe, it didn't matter if you were there in the same place tomorrow as, as you were yesterday. Yeah, there's a question in the chat from, from Catherine asking, uh, did your parents worry about your hitchhiking? It's directed to Ed and her, but I think we can also open it up to Agnati, Alex, and Sarah. Did your parents worry about you hitchhiking? I would say for the most part, they didn't know that we weren't hitchhiking, that uh, we just went places and they didn't think twice about it. Uh, I mean, certainly in high school, I had friends that came and picked me up and I think that that was their assumption. Uh, they gave me bus fare to get to, to high school, but um, it was more economic for me to get there by thumb and have a couple of pennies in my pocket by the end of the day. Yeah, well then um, let me... Well, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Ed. Yeah, so when I was hitchhiking around the States, I would, um, uh, every week or so, I, I would call home and, and ask for myself, you know, and and, uh, and that way my parents, you know, I would say to my parents, well, well tell them, you know, I would ask for George Levy, somebody who didn't exist, and say, well, tell them Ed Levy's in Kansas City. And that way, you know, my parents would know approximately where I was and uh, what I was up to. Yeah. Well, let me ask uh, Alex, Agnati, and Sarah about, you know, that um, kind of the notion of safety. And uh, what are your thoughts? Because, well, we know that the FBI and other law enforcement agencies kept promoting the idea of how unsafe hitchhiking is. And so I'm wondering, you know, if you can share some of your thoughts of, you know, what it felt like, or what it feels like getting into a a stranger's car. I can, I can start on that. Um, it's a total myth that hitchhiking is unsafe. There's, I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a lot of hitchhiking and as a woman, obviously there's a whole nother pile of issues that, and concerns. Um, and out of, you know, hundreds of times getting into people's cars. I think I only had a handful, if that, that that I felt uncomfortable. And then only really actually no situations that I couldn't get out, get out of it because I was uncomfortable. And so, I mean, part of that for me, I think is because I think everyone who hitchhikes, there's a different story that comes with your image, like how you look when the driver sees you on the road. And for me, I got a lot of um, fathers who, who had daughters who would see me and they would think of their daughter. And so they would pick me up. I mean, it's just, it's different for every, you know, um, type of person, like what kind of image comes across, but somehow that's 
Um, that's a big one for me. And then the, I think another thing to acknowledge too is like, it's really easy for me. I found it really easy to see right away when they rolled down their window and I said, I'm going to Albuquerque. I could tell immediately like, okay, I'm not gonna go in the car. So then I'd just be like, oh, I'm not going that way actually, sorry, you can keep going. So I think there's, you have to have a certain level of being able to read read the situation but like I think that it's just I feel like I'm passionate about this because the whole idea that it's that people are afraid to do it it just keeps engendering this idea that we're afraid of each other that you know we're afraid of other people or strangers and it's just like people aren't dangerous and that was just proven to me over and over and over and over again and I don't know. I so that that's my thoughts on that. So I yeah. Yeah, Sarah or Ignati, any follow-up thoughts on yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, there's a lot. This is a big subject, I think. You know, um I think who we are and how we're we present to the world does affect this. I think, you know, it's not an accident that we're white people on this panel, you know. I think there's um I've hitchhiked with people who are less white than I am and have felt differences, you know, <laughs> like there's, um, I think there, there is, there, and, and there is a reality. I, I do think that there's a reality to um, the fact that everything's heightened. So while we have this heightened trust and this heightened intimacy, um, there, there are some scary situations that can arise. And I think part, for me, for me, honestly, that was part of the, of the, um, of the deal. That's part of the game is learning how to sharpen my teeth, you know. And the, and there was a piece of it that was like, you know, I, I really resonate with what Alex said about like you just train yourself to do a vibe check, really fast. Um, you train yourself to use your voice, and um, I've I've always said this this question comes up. It's so it's usually the first question, you know. It's like, isn't that dangerous, you know? And it's like, well. For, for me, I always say, I've never had to use more than my voice, um, which is not true of my high school, my family, uh, taxi drivers, police stations, like, you know, other things that are, <laughs> um, you know, that we're not taught to, to be, uh, to have our alerts on about. And so um, I, I also resonate with that. I learned how to keep myself safe best through hitchhiking. And in that way, it converted itself into this practice of safety, of safety making, in a sense. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I should note that we, we did try to uh, make the, the panel a little more diverse in terms of racial composition. Um, uh, Agnati, anything you'd like to add to this question about safety and trust? Yeah, I just appreciate what has been said already. And, you know, um, I think going into it, there is a lot of fear and whether that is kind of our learned tales around the dangers of hitchhiking. But I remember that when we were, um, we started in San Francisco at, and we were with a friend's house and I was walking down the street and we were like preparing to go. And then I saw these like, pool balls like you know you play pool um and I was like this is going to be my weapon like two pool ball balls and like both sides of my backpack um and I think it was just like just kind of feeling them there and knowing that they're there and there was like no point in at which I was like, oh, I need to use these pool balls to like smash someone, you know, um, but uh, you know, it, it, it does come across your mind. And I think, um, you know, reflecting on it later, uh, you know, within our country, there is sort of this like tale of um, saving white women. And um, often, you know, like realizing that we could kind of like cruise on, on this tale and like that people wanted to protect us. And we're actually like eager to like take us to where we needed to go and go the extra mile. And, you know, just knowing that that reality isn't the same for everyone. Um, and uh, 
that, uh, yeah, that's the unfortunate world that we live in. Well, thank you. Yeah, the question from Adrian in the chat actually is something that I was I was going to ask. She's asking about kind of uh, ways in which you know specifics in which you learned uh, kind of reading the vibe. So that, that's kind of my next question: is can you give us kind of top tips for hitchhiking? What advice uh, suggestions might you have? And and part of that would be, and what you've, I think, what both, uh, what all of you have mentioned is kind of reading this, reading the situation. Uh, so maybe I'll come back to to Sarah and ask her, you know, for some top tips, and especially this idea of reading the vibe. Any suggestions on how to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love having systems um, <laughs> and methods <laughs> for things. Um, I mean. The first thing for me is kind of the mindset. You know, I, I really, one of, one of the mantras that I carry with me is, you know, I'm waiting for the person who wants to pick me up for the right reason. And until that person comes, I don't care who else comes my way. Um, the other part of the mindset is to remember that this is a choice and I'm not desperate, that it would be different no matter how tired I am, even if I've been like, without food and water and I'm like waiting at the side of the highway for like two days, like doesn't matter. The reality is that I'm not needing to go to the hospital, you know? And the, my experience was that, you know, in the moments when you feel like in my first trips, the, the moment, this is something I learned, you know, is in the moments when you feel desperate, you will settle and you will override that sensation of, uh, yes, this feels good. Um, and that's the most dangerous thing that can happen, I think. And so, you know, the first tips are, are around that, of the, you know, being really clear about what you're trying to do and, and who you want to be in contact with. And then for vibe check, I mean, I did, you know, I did certain things. I would have people, if I thought that anybody was, was on drugs or, or was drunk, I would have them get out of the car. <laughs> I would watch them walk and talk and, um, and you know, or, or like extend a conversation a little bit the vibe thing is is really something that goes with the magic it goes with you feeling like you're in connection with yourself and that you're letting that grow um and then and then that speaks to you on its own i think on a hitchhiking trip yeah alex you also mentioned this idea of picking up vibes or reading the driver anything more you can say or other tips you might wish to share I would definitely um, reflect or go to Sarah's um, thinking about not being desperate. I found that the moment I started feeling desperate, especially the sun started going down, that's when you get the people stopping that you're like, why? Like, these are terrible people stopping, you know, because because you're putting out this desperate vibe. It's just like, please, thank me. But one way that I help combat that is um, singing and dancing on the side of the road, which I also found would help just like my own morale and also just like people that were, you know, some people would like laugh or hum or something because I would be like, I have a certain like way of moving anyway, just, yeah. But I mean, practical tips, I think are one thing was like, if you ha if there's water available, drink it. If there's food offered, drink it. If there's a bathroom available, use it. If there's a shower available, use it. It's like anything that comes your way, like take it because you might not know when you get the next chance to have that to have that thing. And then there's also a really complex system in the U.S. of like what, where a good place is to stick out your thumb, depending on how big the city is, how big the road is, what kind of exit ramp you're on, if it's a short or long, like if it's rush hour, if it's not, like, I feel like I could write an entire book just on, you know, depending on the location and time of day where you should actually be standing because, you know, some places people don't have time to stop or they would get, you know, pulled over if they stopped or just like all of these. So there's kind of like that knowledge, which I also found is really fun to collect. Like Sarah said, having systems, you know, it's kind of part of the whole vibe of it. And then as far as like reading people, I would, I mean, I would judge like 
yeah, I mean, I guess I would just try to have a bit of a conversation with them, you know, when they roll down the window and trying to avoid people that are on drugs. Um, although I also did get into the car with people unknowingly who were on drugs or then used drugs later. But um, yeah, it's just kind of like a, a magical, a magical thing. And uh, yeah, I also always wear something very comfortable and you don't want to wear sunglasses or anything that's obscuring your face because that's scary for other people. And I would wear combat pants so that I wasn't like wearing a mini skirt because in a lot of countries and in some places in the United States, if you're a woman, people just automatically think you're a hooker and that's just how it works. So I would definitely wear something that was more masculine and um, that would be a huge tip if you're a um, woman um, in the US hitchhiking and in Spain especially. Yeah, well, let me ask uh, Herb and Ed for your tips or uh, what's the expression, uh, rules of thumb, so to speak, uh, or kind of reading, reading the drivers, uh, were you thinking about the vibes before you got into a vehicle? So one sort of practical thing is that I rarely got into a car that was that had more than one person in it. Um, if there was just a driver, in the worst circumstance, it was me in, in, in a conflict with one human being. If, I, if a car stopped and there were multiple males, I wasn't interested in getting in the car. Um, while it would have been a fantasy in those days for multiple females, it just didn't occur. Um, there were some sometimes when a when a married couple would pick me up, and that, and that felt comfortable. But um, that's really sort of my rule of thumb, as it were. Yeah, Ed. I, I guess the, the rule of thumb was uh, was was like somebody said. It just how how did it feel? And uh, I'd say. Um, a, a bunch of times uh, uh, men picked me up and came on to me, but uh, they took no for an answer. You know, that I, 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 I wasn't interested in, uh, uh, and uh, there was a time uh, I was out in San Francisco and the, and the uh, Haight-Ashbury switchboard would, uh, uh, they ran a, a, a service where uh, people who were willing to give people a place to stay for the night, uh, uh, we we connect with people who needed a space, and uh, so I, I got sent to a, a to a certain address with another guy, and and um, and it, and the guy the guy whose whose house it was was uh, made it clear that uh, uh, that that he expected sex to be part of the package, and, uh, and, and but fortunately for me, the the other guy who was sent there with me thought that was a good idea, so. Uh, so they, they uh, everybody was happy. I, I got my place to stay and, and they got their connection. Okay. Uh, Agnati, any, any tips you might like to share? Uh, not too much more than uh, what people have shared, but I think, you know, there's like, this approach of sort of vagueness at the beginning, like not too much details and like, oh, you know, we're going that way for, you know, whatever amount of, you know, long. And um, it, so it kind of gives you time to sense the person's energy. Um, and, you know, kind of like what was said before, just like space for people to be able to pull off so they're not like going too fast. Or, you know, I saw some comments about truck stops. Um, you know, uh, like having conversations with people like at truck stops that are going in a specific direction can work at times. So, my tip. Right. Uh, well, let me ask uh, each of you if, if you could pick your most memorable ride, the one that, you know, gives you the best <laughs> memories. Uh, what might that be? Let me start with uh, Herb and Ed. Is there anything, any one ride that comes most to mind? Yeah, there's one that jumps out to me. Um, in my undergraduate years, I was an English major. So I was, this was the summer of 67, I was headed to San Francisco and I should mention that 
in those days, um, I hadn't been west of Frederick, Maryland, and um, there was this song on the radio about wearing flowers in your hair and heading to San Francisco. And one summer afternoon, I was on Route 40 west of Baltimore with the sign that said San Francisco. Um, but along that trip, um, I got a ride just outside of St. Louis all the way to the coast. Um, and it was a ride with a guy who was also an English major. So we talked literature for like 1,500, 1,800 miles. And that was great. And as a matter of fact, uh, I, I was going to the University of Maryland at the time. Um, he came and visited me and we continued the conversation. So that was, that was a great, great ride. Yeah, that was a song by uh, Scott McKenzie. I think summer of... Summer of 67. 67, yeah. If you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear flowers in your hair. <laughs> a little uh, detail, Scott is actually from Alexandria, Virginia, so... Oh, yeah. I did not know that. Uh, Ed, how about you? Any one particularly memorable ride that, that stands out? Um, but lots of rides. I, I went to... Um, in summer of 74, I, I, uh, I hitchhiked to Alaska, but I got off along the way and went up into the Canadian uh, Northwest Territories and uh, to Yellowknife. And um, I, I was, uh, so when you got about five miles outside of Yellowknife, you kind of hit the, the edge of civilization and the mosquitoes outnumbered the people. And, and um, so, so people, uh, and anybody who stopped, they, they they were you know they we could take you to the edge of town, but we're not going any further. And uh, finally, I did get a, a ride with a, a couple of just a few few years older than me, and uh, and they uh, when I when I went up into Northwest Territories, I, I said to myself, well, I'm going to go as far as I can get in two days, and then I'll turn around. And um, I, and I got a, a great ride all the way on the second day. But, but coming back was a lot harder than getting to. And ultimately, I, I met some really nice people and we uh, got along well and they brought me back to civilization. Okay, well, let me ask um, Sarah, any, any one particularly memorable ride stands out for you? It is so hard to choose, um, <laughs> it really is. Um, I had I had this one, <laughs> this one whole situation and it was one of those moments in a trip where you're like at a low point and then it just gets like really good, you know. Um, the the long story short is about halfway in, about half an hour into the ride, the the person um, that that was driving asked my friend and I if we'd ever flown small planes, and we were like no <laughs> he was like do you want to and we were like yeah um, <laughs> which led to like a whole series of um getting to know a town and a family and um a history and a culture and you know this was in this is in california like history of and culture of this town it's in boron california um and uh and which and led to me flying a plane over the boron mine in California. That was a really, really excellent ride. <laughs> uh, you were you were operating the, the plane? You were at the control? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like they did the guy did um take off and then like it was one of these really old small crafts where they just I don't know, they like can flip whatever. He did a thing and then suddenly I was in control. <laughs> <laughs> that was really special. It was a really special moment. It was it was one of those um like cinematic, you know, uh, moments where the world matches on the outside what you're feeling on the inside, and I carry it with me always. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alex, any one particularly memorable ride for you? I mean, yeah, this is like the hardest question. There's so many, and there's also different types of. There's also different types of good rides. You know, there were rides that were, like maybe they were short and insignificant, like in the big picture, but were exactly what I needed at the time, or someone just said like the right words and it, you know, or whatever. But I mean, the one that just sticks out for me was actually in France when I was hitchhiking with um, my friend Julia. And 
it was like we were in the middle of nowhere and it was getting dark and we were on this roundabout and it was just like it looked like we were going to be sleeping outside in the middle of nowhere and this like these two semis went around us once and then 20 minutes later they came back and stopped and (laughs) the cab of the semi that like kind of ushered us over it was just like absolutely decked out to the max with like red velvet and it had this neon sign that was flashing it said freddy and it was like this guy was just so sweet and hilarious and it turned out that his partner was the man driving the truck behind him so it was like these two like gay truckers in northern France who picked us up and they were so you know they were so like concerned for our welfare that they drove through this tiny town where like semis definitely were not allowed to drop us off like at the person's front door essentially where we were going and they went totally out of their way and I remember stopping at this gas station in rural France and I had never seen like an espresso machine in a gas station before and they got these two like little espressos and they're so classy and it was just a gas station and I was just like France is so cultured (laughs) and it was just like it was just so hilarious and of course I didn't really speak a lot of French at the time my friend Julia did so to me it was all very mysterious and amazing that all this magic was happening and she was actually doing all the translating but um that was one of the best rides I think I've had the best rides with truckers they're such amazing people yeah, Agnati, anything you'd like to share with us? Yeah, so the one that I'm thinking about is you're trying to get from New Mexico to Arizona, and we had a very long journey. <laughs> I see Alex going like this. Of course, that one. I can't believe I didn't say that one is my favorite. <laughs> oh, my God. Ah! I, I thought you were going to say it because you were going first. I was like, Alex might say that one first. I'll have to do a different one. Um, so we were like, kind of like a, a little bit desperate. Don't tell anyone because it's not part of the safety rules. Um, but we were like, we need uh, to get in. It was like getting dark. It was like starting to get dark. And so this guy had a pickup truck and he was like, oh yeah, maybe I can give you a ride. Like, let me talk to my friends or people and like the other two women were like not really about us being in the cab with them he was like so I can give you a ride but you're gonna have to go in the back of the pickup truck and we're like yeah that sounds great um so we were bundled up in the back of the pickup truck looking at like the painted walls like it was the one of the most beautiful rides and um later he gave us blankets and we stopped at a gas station to get like whiskey and we were seeing like 99 bottles of beer on the wall and like Alex like peed in a cup while while we were in the back of this pickup truck and then the moon rose over the mountains and it was a full wolf moon and um we were then freezing our butts off but it was so beautiful to be just like open air in this gorgeous place in New Mexico and Arizona and I have a video of that oh uh would you like to share that with us now if if it's the time well sure why not uh okay we will share it. I think this one is it. Is this the right one? Okay, here we go. Can you see it okay? Uh, right now I just see... A backpack? So, yeah, it, a backpack? Yeah. Yes, um, so it's not the best quality, but it is a video and I would recommend just like turning your volume down a little bit because it's mostly just windy. Um, so I'm going to start it.
I think that's enough. <laughs> Thank you, Agnati. And uh, I see there's a question in the chat asking if our moderator has one particular <laughs> ride that sticks out. And I um, actually following up on what Agnati was talking about, Arizona, New Mexico. So I was on kind of the other side of the equation. Uh, I had a Volkswagen bus from 1967 until I sold it in 1978 and haven't owned a car since. But a VW bus was emblematic for hitchhikers that it would almost always stop. So I, I picked up lots of people during those years, but perhaps most memorable, just to follow up on Arizona, uh, one of my many jobs <laughs> was, I was working as an archeologist for the Navajo Nation um, based in Window Rock, Arizona. And one night in the middle of nowhere, you know, halfway to Cayenta and many farms, I picked up a guy on the side of the road and. He asked if I'd like to go to a, uh, uh, to a blessing way ceremony, which is something that I hadn't had a chance to do. And of course, these things last all night, um, filled with dancing and singing, uh, good medicine, great food, mutton stew and fry bread. Uh, so that was one of my, and uh, it, since it's a VW bus, you can sleep in the bus, which is what we all did. Um, well, looking at the time, I see we, we've, we've gone about 50 minutes, so I would like to open it up um, to questions and comments from the audience. Uh, and Lisa, you can unmute people so they can um, talk to us directly. And I've seen we've had a number of very good comments from Vicki Greenhouse, who seems to have also a lot of hitchhiking experience. So Vicki, are you there and you want to add to some of what we've been saying. Um, sorry. Yeah, go, sorry, I stopped your, I didn't mean to stop your video. I was trying to uh, unmute you. <laughs> it's better if I don't, if, if people unmute themselves. Vicki, where, I'm trying to find where you are on here. Uh, go ahead. You can yeah. start your video too, if you would. Share your video again. I'm trying to start my video. It says you cannot start your video because the host has disabled. Oh, oh gosh, um, I, I can't find you in the... Oh, oh, oh there it goes, oh, Vicky, there it goes. Well, well, Vicki, why don't you introduce yourself? Just tell us who you are and what okay. you're... Okay, sure. Um, my name is Vicki Greenhouse. I'm also from Baltimore. And um, uh, I knew Ed Lee, known him since... Uh, high school, um, although we didn't go, go to the same high school, um, we probably did, so we did. Um, I did quite a bit of through Europe one summer. Um, I didn't have money for a Eurail pass, um, and uh, most of my hitchhiking experiences were great. I think that the um, main thing was is it expanded my world. Um, I had lots of experiences I would not have been in a financial uh, position to have had um, in my early 20s, in my teens. Um, I did once hitchhike all the way from um, uh, Reno, not Reno, I guess, yeah, Reno to, or Lake Tahoe to uh, Washington DC in three days using truck stops. That was like, oh, we had this great idea. That would be a really fast way of getting back. and. Um, was not really such a great idea. But in general, I did meet wonderful people who um, would sometimes say, oh, where are you going? Oh, no, no, you should go here. I'm gonna call my friends and tell them you're on your way and, and he'll show you around or whatever. I met a lot of really nice people. Hitchhiking in Europe was really um, a very positive experience all around and did feel very safe. Um, I think I did it for about eight or nine weeks, a uh, whole summer. Um, and uh, had good experiences. Uh, even one time someone was like concerned that I didn't have a place to stay. And I'm like, oh, fine, it's getting dark. Just, you can just drop me off here. And he, he insisted on, you know, going into a hotel and I got a little nervous, what's he up to? But he had booked me a room and then left and gave me the key to the room and just felt I would be safer that way. And just all different kinds of people who you'd meet. Um, I did have one friend who was um, hitchhiking alone 
uh, late teens and was sexually assaulted. So I will say, you know, it wasn't 100% safe. Um, but most of the time you can read the vibes and uh, I, I don't regret the experiences that I had. They're good for the most part. Yeah, thank you, Vicki. Um, anyone oh. else? Uh, yes, Adam. Adam Gottlieb, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm Sarah's brother. Hey, everyone. Um, <laughs> and I, I would love to hear more about the magic. For those of you who, who have had an experience that you would describe as magical, what have you learned about magic? If you can share any specific lessons about how does magic work? <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. Um, I'm not gonna share my video. I have COVID and I'm quarantining right now, um, but this is a lovely panel. Thank you everyone for sharing your experiences. Okay, anyone would like, would Paul like to- Paul has the comments. Adam's, Adam's Paul, question about oh, magic. I'll be glad to hear a magic story. Um, I was in the Canary Islands and I, without the setup, trying to get back from one side of the island to the other, middle of already pretty dark at night. Um, I am not a Spanish speaker. I got picked up by a guy who was uh, a native and came to understand that he had a hotel and I was welcome to spend the night there. Um, and okay, um, I'm thinking, you know, like three rooms on top of a liquor store. I'm from Baltimore, you know. Uh, no, it was actually, this was New Year's Eve, by the way, 1975. And it was actually a bankrupt high rise hotel. And he and his family were um, taking care of it um, while the bankruptcy proceeded. And we got to spend New Year's Eve with the family. Um, fabulous night where much of the night was the joy of trying to communicate. Um, I, I speak French, it didn't help. Um, and um, I remember distinctly the, the uh, experience of uvas at New Year's. Uh, at every, every chime of the bell, a grape goes into your mouth, and this was just just a just a joyous experience, and the magic is being open to possibilities, and they occur. Okay. Anyone else uh, on magic? Sarah, would you like to answer your brother's question? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I hope you're feeling okay, Adam. I didn't know you were sick. <laughs> I am. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think. My, what I learned about magic and, and what I, you know, is that you, you develop a relationship to building it. And then there's little signs, but the little signs are just there kind of to, to keep you on track. And, and the magic is like this big, deep thing that happens and then that um, unfolds for you almost throughout your whole life, I think. Um, but one example, I was in Big Sur I was with a friend um, who actually, Agnati, you know, uh, Kat Reeve. Um, and, and we were just, we had, we were like, so it was so hard for us to leave Big Sur. We had, we were supposed to have left for, you know, days ago and we didn't want to because we kept getting rides back and forth and back and forth because it kept being so good and so cool. And um, we were just so happy living <laughs> in Big Sur. Um, so a lot of time went by and then we were like, oh, you know, we should get on the road and get on to the next part of our trip. And, and we'd built up so much energy um, that right before we were asking for a ride, I was like, I just want a chocolate chip cookie. And like straight up this person like yeah. drove a car into the parking lot right where we were took a paper bag off of the dashboard, walked out of the car, handed it to and us, like said goodbye, oh, and walked away. And we opened it, and it was a chocolate chip cookie. And we were just like, no way. <laughs> and then in the next moment, we were like, all right, I want a van with a bunch of kids. Like, I want a bunch of kids in this van, and I want it to be big. And I want, and so, and then, you know, the next thing you know, there was a group of surfers um, from New Zealand, I think, like four guys from New Zealand with this big van that pulled up and took us out of Big Sur. And that wasn't the most magical part of the whole thing. The most magical part was what happened before and after, but it was a moment when, like, 
you say, hey, we're doing this magic game, right? And the universe is like, yeah, we are. I got you. <laughs> All right. Well, I see uh, uh, Ken has his hand raised and Saul also, oh. but, but first oh. let me ask uh, Agnati and Alex if you want to respond to the question about magic. Absolutely. Um, so there was this one time we were sitting at a coffee, like a gas station or something. And we were um, drinking coffee and writing postcards, which was our normal go-to um, old school kind of postcard storytelling. And I would actually write um, postcards to my brother who had muscular dystrophy and couldn't do some of the things that I could do because I was able-bodied and he had a lot of physical limitations. So I made a point to bring him along on the journey through postcard writing. And uh, this guy comes up and he's like, oh, you guys hitchhikers? And we're like, yeah. And he's like, um, I'll be back in 20 minutes. Um, if you're still here, I can give you a ride because we were going in the same direction. And we're like, sure. And so he comes back in 20 minutes, like he said, and we go outside and it's a VW bus. And this is like in like 2010, an old school 1960s VW bus. And Alex and I lost our shit. We were like, what? Oh my God, this is the dream. This is magic. And so we got in the, in the bus and we were just sharing conversations and he was like yeah I used to hitchhike all the time and now I'm an organic farmer and a Buddhist and kind of a bishop or something like that and and we just got into this beautiful like conversation about the kind of spirit of hitchhiking and just the energy that you put out and the energy that you receive in this like cyclical experience and understanding of the world because of your openness and because of the ways that you're kind of calling in and at, at that moment a feather just like fell from the sky and we were like in a van so we were like where did this feather come from and he was like here take this feather remember me and we were like we need to remember this moment so we both got feather tattoos to remind ourselves of that magic yeah. Alex do you have anything to add to that story <laughs> well the thing that was crazy was that he literally dropped us off without like any planning he dropped us off in front of a tattoo parlor and like so we immediately got the tattoo. That was like the, it was, cr and we literally only had $40 like together. And it just like, we had just enough money for each of us to get like a crappy tattoo. And that was like the rest of the money we had or something crazy. But no, I mean, I feel like I have, I feel like I'm really glad that um, this, Adam, I think Adam name was um, brought this topic up because in all honesty, it is probably like, the main point of hitchhiking is like the magic and i think the thing about magic in this case and in pretty much every case is it appears when you're able to surrender and that's like that's the thing about hitchhiking is like you have to take care of yourself and you have to know your limits but magic can only appear when you when you allow it in and it's like everywhere at all times and so i think magic happens when you're hitchhiking when you're most in in that attitude of just like letting the world take care of you, letting other people take care of you, and trusting that the situation will work out right. And yeah, I mean, I have a million stories about like things I needed in the moment that just came. But I mean, we can go on. But thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Yeah, Saul Brody, uh, you have you have a question or comment? Yes. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, I haven't done nearly as much hitchhiking as the panelists have, but I used to hitchhike from Penn State, where I was an undergraduate, uh, which is in central Pennsylvania, to my home in Philadelphia, often, very often. And one time I got a ride and and uh, was headed towards Philadelphia, and someone dropped me off 
in rural Chester County, which is, I don't know, 30, somewhere it's about 30 miles, 25, 30 miles uh, southwest of Philadelphia. And I had decided to, I had my guitar case with me and I didn't need a guitar, but it was very handy to carry my laundry home for the weekend. I had my dirty laundry in the guitar case. And I went into this bar, maybe to use the bathroom or maybe to get a, a beer. And there was all, it was Saturday afternoon and all these guys were there playing the jukebox and they were kind of drunk and they insisted that I play them a song on the guitar. And I said, no, no, not today. I, I, I really don't feel like it, not today. And they insisted and they insisted and they wouldn't let me go until I opened the guitar case and they smelled my dirty laundry. <laughs> One more thing, some of you may have noticed in the chat, I, I mentioned um, uh, that there's a song called Hitchhiker that I learned from the uh, Blue Velvet Band, which is a bunch of uh, 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 wonderful bluegrass and, and country musicians from uh, who at that time in the 60s were, were out of Boston and New York. And I still sing that song, it's a very nice song, Blue Velvet Band, if you wanna check it out. Uh, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Saul. Um, Ken, Roseman, you also had a question or comment for us? I was, um, right, Blue Velvet Band. I've, I've heard of them. I think they had an album on Warner Brothers. Um, I think so. Yeah, uh, two things. Um, first of all, since I am now going to turn 70 in October, I have not hitchhiked in years, and I suspect I will never do it again. It, I think in the 60s, I, you know, early 70s, even through the 80s, maybe I did a little bit, but there came a time when it just seemed like society was dangerous enough and I stopped, haven't done it in 30 years at least. Um, the other thing is, yes, that wonderful source of fount of all knowledge, Facebook, has a section called Creepy Catalog. It's kind of like urban legend type stuff. And you know, you see these occasional stories about, oh, they picked up a hitchhiker and he or she disappeared, never to be seen again. I wondered if any of you had had any, God, I don't know, you know, I mean, it kind of takes off for magical, but it's more like, I don't know, horror, mystery, fantasy, I don't know, urban legend, that kind of thing, wondered, um, if uh, any of you had had any experiences like that, knew anybody who had, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, anyone? Ed, it looked like you were, you wanted to say something before. Yeah, uh, yeah in, in terms of magic, I don't know why I didn't think of this the first, the first time around, but um, uh, people who know me in the audience uh, know that, uh, I was uh, married to Debbie for 33 years, and when Debbie and I uh, started to, uh, and and then uh, uh, and then she developed cancer and, and passed away eight years ago. Uh, but um, we we, uh, we we started to date in uh, last year of college and hit it off very well. And and I had been planning the trip to Europe that I told you guys a little bit about. So one day I go to Debbie and said, I just don't know what to do because I love being with you and I've, yet I've been planning this trip to Europe. And Debbie, without missing a, a beat, she said, well, I'm coming too. And, and that, that she did. And we spent six months sharing a tent together. And, and when we got back, we said, if we can share a tent for six months, then we must be pretty compatible. So we went from sharing a tent to sharing a single bed to sharing a, to sharing a life. And that was the magic. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Ed. Uh, Lisa, you were telling me, uh, uh, you had mentioned something about a hitchhiking story from your time in the Peace Corps in Estonia. You're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, um, I wouldn't identify as a hitchhiker. I have hitchhiked. I've probably picked up for a hitchhiker. So in, in Ireland, especially where I've spent a lot of time going to different festivals and elsewhere in the UK. Um, but I I am recalling a funny story. I used to hitchhike a lot as a Peace Corps volunteer in my, out of my village in Estonia. And I felt 
very safe because everyone knew who I was. And uh, there was a chicken factory in my village um, where a lot of Russian people worked. And I, so, I spoke only Estonian and they tended not to speak Estonian and definitely not English. And usually people knew who I was and, and oftentimes they even thought I was CIA. Um, so I figured I was safe, you know, going into a car. And anyway, a blizzard was about to start and this rusty, rusted out Lada came kind of pedaling up to me, pulled over to pick me up. And um, I mean, like there were holes in the floor, like a Flintstone car. <laughs> and these two guys, they couldn't speak any, any Estonian or English, barely any. And um, we got to the highway. I was trying to get into the capital. The snow, the blizzard was starting and the car, they stopped the car and I didn't know why. And they were like arguing with each other. And I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And, and I had my gloves off. And then they finally said, they were telling me in Russian, like what was wrong. What they were saying was there's no gas. They finally said benzene, which I knew that word. And I said, oh, we're out of gas and I start smacking him in the face with my gloves just because it was so comical and we we all started laughing because it was just it was just a madcap scene and the because the one guy ran off and I thought they had a fight and you know they were just arguing over the gas and it was just it was really um really a funny funny scene <laughs> yeah Sarah yeah, I wanted to respond to Ken's um, question before it took me a moment to kind of digest how I wanted to respond to it. Um, but it's a, it's an important one, I think. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the things that's happened around uh, the narratives around hitchhiking is that certain things that are true get projected onto things. Um, that, that you know, there's there's danger and safety that coexists. And sometimes there are these distorted stories that actually serve to mask stories that are real. Um, there are parts of the US where it is known that native indigenous people are systematically disappearing um, from the roads. And um, that's a real thing that's happening. And whether or not they were intentionally hitchhiking or not, um, <laughs> is almost a distraction to the story. Um, there's people who are um, gay beaten when, when, when hitchhiking. Um, in the South, there's a particular trend of, of trans people who have disappeared um, on roads. There are real uh, pockets of violence that are not discussed or are discussed badly in the context of what's safe and unsafe and what practices are, are kept among people in society. And so, you know, I just, I think it's, it's important to, to kind of open that, that question and, and to think like, what is it that, you know, when, I, when I'm living a magical experience, what am I, what am I protected from? Um, and not to say like, oh no, that doesn't happen. Although to, in my own experience, no, that doesn't happen, you know, but, but that lives adjacently to known violences that are systematically happening um, and that intersect with the practice of hitchhiking and just being in a public space and on a public byway. So I, I just wanted to, to answer that. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, anyone else would like to speak to that point? Yeah. Um just brings to mind the fact that when I was coming back from uh, the West Coast in 1967, I decided to hitchhike through the South. And uh, in those days I had facial hair as well, uh, but uh, those were the days of freedom riders and a lot of uh, violence directed toward people who were freedom riders. So I shaved, I, I went through the South on the way home, but I went through clean shaven because I wanted to get home. Okay. Any other thoughts on this topic? I mean, I'll I'll speak a little bit to yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's kind of hard actually because when the question was asked, I was like, I don't want to talk about those experiences. <laughs> Because, you know, there are, I definitely had a few experiences that were uncomfortable. And like Sarah had said, I haven't had any experience that I couldn't get out of with my voice. And a lot of times, you know, a few that I'm thinking of in particular, you know, if the person was making unwelcome advances or they were asking me to do something I didn't want to do, just me simply saying like, uh, no, that's not what I'm into and not why I'm here was enough for them to be like, oh, okay. Never mind, you know, which is amazing. Like that, it didn't become more intense than that. And I think maybe one one time that was the scariest for me was a road rage case, which was that was very terrifying. I think I'm still processing that. Like going into LA, and this guy was having a road rage episode, and it was like um, very terrifying. And I and that was one of the rides that I. I asked to get out before um, my destination by quite a while when I was stuck in LA, which if anyone's tried to hitchhike out of LA is like, ah, the worst. But um, I think the other thing I keep thinking of too is just that I think sometimes for me, it's hard to talk about hitchhiking. And I, I think for years, I, I haven't talked about it so much because I have such a privilege of being a white woman in this country that my experience of hitchhiking is really different from a lot of other people's experience. And I kind of, as I got older, I realized that I don't think I was aware of it so much as it was happening. I just was kind of like, oh, hitchhiking is so safe, like whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I still do believe that in ways, but just to reflect on like, um, you know, I have the ability to change my appearance. You know, I can like look more masculine if I want to, or I can put my hair up and take my hair down, or like Herb said, like, you know, he shaved his face and like the things like that. But someone, you know, who has a different skin color, that's, you know, they can't, that's like part of, that's part of the whole thing. And it's just, yeah, it's just like a lot about privilege. I think hitchhiking, there's like a lot of stories about that. So just, yeah, I blame that. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um, I actually just wanted to add, just so that it's named, you know, one of the things that um, in that adjacency to violence that happens, um, you know, you become, I, you, as, as Alex mentioned earlier, like when when I was in, in truck stops and in many situations, people asked if I was a sex worker, you know, and that was often the first impression. And there is such a lack of safety for that community. There is so much disappearance and so much violence that is happening um, upon bodies who are working in that profession. And that was something that I really saw um, and, and a danger that really is real, I think for, for people. I just wanted that to be named because it was part of those. It's part of it, I think. Thank you. Well, I see that we've been at this for about 80 minutes. Uh, I don't want to keep people too long, but maybe we could conclude with some kind of final thoughts from our panelists about hitchhiking, its significance today, kind of the journey. Uh, Anyone like to take a stab at that? <laughs> or do you think you've already said, said everything uh, that's on your mind? I know, Alex, it looks like you're, you've got something you want to say. Well, I was just going to say that Ed is raising his hand. Yeah. OK. Um, all right. One finger at a time. Yeah, all right. Yes. Go ahead, Ed. OK. You know, I, I don't know how, how I'm forgetting this guy, the guy's name, but uh, the guy from Baltimore who uh, uh, who who did, did Pink Flamingos and John Waters. Guys. John Waters. Uh, John Waters. John Waters uh, recently uh, did a book about hitchhiking across country, and uh, and and that was it was really uh, uh, for anybody who who's been out there hitchhiking. It was uh, it's a great book to bring back uh, good memories, and also, also the. the when his his difference uh, for mine was a lot of the people who picked him up knew who he was, whereas probably nobody who picked me up knew who I was. But that 
I really uh, recommend that book. That's a, like, what would it be like to be hitchhiking today? Yeah. No, John Waters has a very distinctive appearance, so he would be, I think, somewhat recognizable. Uh, Alex, Sarah, Agnati, any? Hmm. You had mentioned um, in our in our texts. In, in our notes earlier about kind of the spiritual practice and, and we've touched on it with the magic, but I'm curious to hear from the panelists, like how hitchhiking informs your spirituality. Okay, anyone, Agnati? Yeah, um, so when Alex and I, we're, we talked about this trip we were going to take. We were like, we're going to revolutionize how the world sees women. You know, like we are strong. We are not vulnerable. You know, we got this. And that's kind of like what we thought. And then once we hit the road, it was a completely different experience. And it really got me in touch with something beyond myself and the energy beyond myself and the connection between people and um, the ability to be open to these signs that the world sends you. Um, and it became a spiritual journey. The whole thing became a spiritual journey. And, you know, like I said, um, I was writing postcards to my brother along the way to kind of bring him along. And when I returned to Chicago, I um, told him, cause I had to be kind of stealth in the postcards um, about the fact that I was hitchhiking. I was like, yeah, I'm traveling and meeting these people. Um, but then I was like, no, I was hitchhiking. And, you know, I just had this spiritual awakening and I, and I believe in something 